And so that is, uh, we are going to be in Nehemiah again this morning. And, um, oh, by the way, just on the prayer one, on Communion Sundays, we do, um, if anybody would like to be, to have the elders anoint them and pray with them in the prayer room, um, we're available afterwards. We're available any Sunday. Just come and talk to us. Come grab one of us. But um, on Communion Sundays, we don't run off. You know, we make sure that we're up here if anybody would like prayer, then um, please uh, just, you can just head back to the prayer room after the service and we would happy, be happy to anoint and uh, anoint you with oil and pray. That's according. That's, we do that in obedience to a passage in James. So we're in Nehemiah. We're back in Nehemiah. Um, and I know it's been a little bit in and out for the last little bit, um, but you know what? I, I personally have seen God's timing in that. Um, even when I was going into Nehemiah and kind of laying out the, the passages, one of the things I just, I've said this before, I really believe this is where God has us right now. That what he's looking, where he's looking to build us as a church is to be that light. He's, he's kind of brought us together. We're settled in. This is who we are. This is who God has brought to be here on chapel, this local body. And now he's, he's growing us. How is it that we can be that, that church on a hill, that light that draws people to him? can be that witness for Jesus. And so one of the things as I went through Nehemiah is that it felt like we don't want to just be hearers of the word, but doers. And so that I think God's just kind of slowing us down a little bit, that we don't get ahead of ourselves, that we're able to actually go with what he's showing us in his word. And so um, we're, we're back in it today, and we're coming to chapter 3. And, uh, and so chapter 3 is like it's just a list. It's one of those ones, if you're in your Bible reading plan, you probably skimmed through it, right? You probably didn't read through everything because it's just a list of all the people that um, built the sections of the wall. They've started to build the wall. And, uh, and so it's, it's a historical record. I've said this before. God's word is both history and holy. That's the way I like to remind myself. It's both history and holy. The names and the places and the, that we're going to read this morning are real people. They really did the things we see. This is what Nehemiah, as governor, recorded for us, and we still have it here today. But it's also holy. And holy is just always what reminds me that God's word means that means it's holy. It means that he chose this to be part of his inspired word because it can speak to us today in the situation that you're in, that miracle you're looking for, that promise, that God can speak to you through his word today. And so that's the goal this morning is that we hear, God, are you saying anything to me that applies to you this morning? Not just kind of an interesting history lesson, Bible Bible lesson, but what is he looking to say to you? And so it's going to be a bit of a buffet because it's all these different people. And and so you can kind of, I just encourage you, you don't have to try and remember everything. Just listen for just one thing. Lord, what is one thing that you're looking to say to me this morning, and you can forget the rest, and go listen to it online if you want to make notes or something, but just, I'd love you for you to listen for just one thing that God's looking to say. So to bring us up to speed, historically, where we're at again, so this is the beginning of chapter 3, so what's happened already, year is 444 BC, Nehemiah is a, a third generation Jew, living, was living in Susa, the capital of Persia. Persia is like the empire, dominant world empire at the time, and he's the cupbearer to the king, Artaxerxes. And so he has this great job, really high-ranking advisor official to the king, Artaxerxes. And his brother, Hanani, comes back, had done this like 2,000-kilometer 2, trip to Jerusalem, comes back and gives this report, the verse that's on the screen, that Jerusalem is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates are destroyed by fire. And this is the, the word that comes back to Nehemiah and it breaks his heart. You know, and he's grieved by it. And so he, he just begins fasting and praying, basically, Lord, surrenders himself, Lord, use me. If you can use me, a cupbearer, to try and build this wall 2,000 kilometers away, I'll do it. And then God starts to work, and we read through that, and God gives him an opportunity and opens the door, and he presents to the king, and the king says, oh, yeah, I'll, you can go. I'll give you official letters, make it officially a king's building project. I'll give you letters to the king's forest for the timber. I'll give you an armed escort to go with you. And so Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem, and he rests for three days. That was a good reminder <laughs> that we need to work from rest. Rest for three days, and then he, he goes around and he examines the wall. And it's so bad, he can't even ride his donkey or mule or whatever around it. He has to get off at one point because it's so broken down. But then he gathers the people together and he says, hey, do you see the trouble and shame we're in? And the people, this is kind of an odd question we said because 
They're the ones living there. The people he brought, they're the ones living in the rubble. And they've been living there for generations, a couple generations now, and they haven't done anything about it. And here's this guy comes from 2,000 kilometers away, and he comes, and he's like, hey, do you, have you noticed <laughs> you know, the walls are broken down? It's kind of a rhetorical question. Of course they do. So the problem wasn't that they didn't notice. It's that they were either too fearful to do it or doubted or just didn't believe that God wanted to, them to at that time. For whatever reason, they hadn't built the walls. And Nehemiah comes and he says, this is what God's calling me to. And it was neat because he was able to say, look at what God has already done. And he's able to testify, give a testimony to what God had already done. He moved the heart of the king and he sent an armed escort and he sent me letters and he made it official business. And the people rally around Nehemiah. And here we come to chapter 3, and they begin to build the wall. Um, for us, what we've talked about is how it looks like to us is this, the reason that it broke Nehemiah's heart is because Jerusalem was supposed to be this great witness for God, right? It was, it's, it's where the temple was. It was supposed to be this city on a hill, supposed to be a light that drew all the other nations to come to know the one true God. And here it was left in trouble and shame. And so we said for us, what's our Jerusalem? Our Jerusalem, we are Christians, Christians. We bear his name, right? We're supposed to be a witness. The church is supposed to draw people. People should be looking at the church and saying, in all the troubles in life, they should be drawn to the church. But that's not what we see, is it? We don't see people. We went through COVID was so hard, and yet people didn't flock to churches. Why is that? How can we build up the witness that they would come to know the love of God, the love that they need, eternal life? And so that's what we're looking to build up, our witness. And we, we looked in the New Testament, and we kind of saw it in these three ways, just as a review. Unity was one, that unity draws people. Jesus said, you know, love one another just as I've loved you. Then they will know that you're my disciples. And so unity is one. Holiness, which I always just flip it and just say we know how much damage hypocrisy does right how many how often non-christians that's a criticism is that they're hypocrites right and so we see that and so we strive for holiness we want to live what we preach we want to display that truth in our lives that will draw people to him and then truth that we're that we believe as society continues to go trying to figure it out on their own Wisdom, human wisdom, we say, no, we believe that there's a God who created us and he knows the best way to live life. And so we're going to live our lives and build it on God's word. And uh, that as well will be a witness to those. And so that's what it looks like for us. And so as we go into this chapter three, what we're going to see is um, how can we do that? How can we build up this witness? What does that look like? And what can we take from this uh, building of the wall? It's going to be, there's going to be a lot of parallels that are going to be pretty obvious just for ministries and, and uh, serving in a church. And so Nehemiah chapter 3, um, starting at verse 1. You can turn there if your Bibles, in your Bibles if you'd like, or I'll have it here on the screen. Verse 1 starts like this. It says, Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hanano. And so it starts off, I, I like how Nehemiah starts off with this place. He starts at the Sheep Gate, which was like northeast corner of Jerusalem, up by the Temple Mount, okay? That's where he starts. And he starts with the priests. And I just thought, That's, isn't that interesting? Like of all the places Nehemiah, he's just doing a historical record here at this point, right? But he starts up there with the priests, and I think this would have shocked people. Right, Because of all the people that would have been exempt from laying brick, and you know, of all the people, they would think, well, they wouldn't be included in the ones who were picking up stones out of the rubble and rebuilding the wall. It would have been the priests. But here they are. It starts with not, just the, not only just the priest, even the high priest was out there working hard to build this wall. And so it was just a great reminder that um, we are all called to do this work um, of building up the wall of building the witness, God's witness to the world. I, uh, I reminded me of a story from, from back in, in Wasega Beach, Faith Church there. There was an older man, part of that congregation, and, and uh, he told me a story from back in the 80s when he started going to that church. He'd been there for a long time, and he said he was, at that point, a young man, young family, and he, had, uh, he was looking for a church, and he, he drove by the Faith Church in Wasega, and he, and he saw him in a ditch. 
for drainage, something had plugged or something. So he's out there digging this ditch. And he stopped and asked what time the service was and uh, what time does the service start. And so the man, you know, shared with him, you know, it's, here's the time it starts. And they had a short little casual conversation. And then this, this man carried on his way and, and came back with his family on Sunday. And when he came on Sunday and got there on Sunday, he discovered that the man that was digging the ditch was the pastor. <laughs> and, and he'd been out. And he told me that story because it left such an impact on him that that was one of the things. It wasn't the preaching the first day. It wasn't that. But the fact that that pastor was the one that was out digging the ditch out front because there had been a block in the drainage made such an impact on him that he ended up being there. And he was there for decades up until I was. And so leaders lead by example. We talked about this last week. Leaders lead by example. Um, what was the phrase there last week? Um, elders, leaders, are leaders who serve and servants who lead. Kind of that picture. But uh, all of us, many of us are leaders in our homes, leaders in different areas. We lead by example. And so the priests, but then the other thing that's really interesting here is the, the sheep gate. I think I got a note there. And as I thought about that, it starts with the sheep gate. And what's so interesting about the sheep gate is that it was the gate nearest the temple. Okay, and so it was the gate that all the sacrifices would come in. So all the sheep, majority, but the other sacrifices, well, they'd come in through that gate, and that's why it was named the Sheep Gate. And I don't know if Nehemiah knew this when he was writing it. The Holy Spirit knew, inspiring them, right? But just that he would start with the Sheep Gate. Because when you think about that, you think about what we're, as we're looking to rebuild the walls, where do we start? Who's the, the lamb that takes the sin of the world, as it says in John 1? It's Jesus. Who's the gate, as it says in, in Matthew 7? It's Jesus. He's the way, right? Who is the, the, the chief cornerstone from Ephesians 2? And then we're going to see when we get down, the first verse here mentions the sheep gate, and the last verse of the chapter mentions the sheep gate because they go all the way around the wall. And so I thought, how, how like Revelation 1.8 is that, that Jesus is the alpha and the omega. He's the start and the end. And so I thought that was just really neat that as they, they start here, they start at, it starts on Jesus. He's the gate. He's the sacrifice, the final sacrifice for sin. And then it says that they consecrated it. This is the only gate that actually says, it mentions that they consecrated it. It doesn't say that about any of the other ones. But they consecrated it. And, and just that reminder that they consecrated means to be set apart for God. And so I thought this, this wall is going to be, that's going to be, there's going to be a lot of value for the people living in it. Just practical things. You know, protection, obviously. And, right? and so there, this wall is going to provide a lot of things for these people. But that's not the primary thing that it's for. The primary thing is that it's, it's to be that witness for God. They're looking to build it up, to, to get God's name out of trouble and shame that it had fallen into. And looking to lift it up again. And, that, and so they consecrate it. The first gate the one that represents Jesus, they consecrated to the Lord. Verse 2, we'll carry on. And so I'll just say the obvious, that uh, that's a reminder for us. Our number one goal with our church is to glorify God. We get involved in lots of ministries, there's lots of good things, we enjoy lots of good things, fellowship and all kinds of things here, but our number one goal is always to glorify God. Verse 2, and next to him, the men of Jericho built... And the next to them, Zakur, the son of Imri, built. And so Zakur is, and there's going to be a couple other names that are going to be similar to him because they're mentioned again in, in Nehemiah chapter 10. And that's because by the time we get to Nehemiah chapter 10, the wall's been built up and Nehemiah brings everybody together and they re-covenant themselves to the Lord because they recognize that the reason the walls were broken down in the first place is because the Israelites had turned their back on God's covenant. They'd gone to worship idols, and all those prophets had gone and warned them, if you do this, you know, God's going to judge you. There's going to be a nation. He's going to let a nation come in and take over you, and they didn't listen, and that's what happened. Babylon came in and destroyed Jerusalem 140 years before Nehemiah was there. And so they, they recommit, they repent of all that, and then they recovenant themselves to God to follow him and be obedient to him. And, and then chapter 10 actually records the names of all these people, all these heads of tribes that, that put their signatures to this new covenant. And Zakur was one of them, and there's a few more as we go through. But he was committed to Jerusalem being that light of the world. And I just thought this was a good reminder, too, that, that all the opportunities, all the things that God calls us to serve in all these different ways, but we always keep remind ourselves that it's within 
when it comes to things in church, it's, it's underneath that umbrella of, has God called you here to this church at this time for a purpose? That's my definition of a member. Has God called you to this church at this time for a purpose? Because once, if you make that commitment, then it's, then it's all the other op- opportunities that come up. Then we're a family, church family, working together to be a witness. And you might take parts and help out in all kinds of different ways, but it's all because you have, you started with, you believe that God has called you to this place at this time for a purpose. And that's kind of what Sakura had did. He was building up this wall because he was committed to living and obediently to God, to building God's kingdom. So he put his, his signature to it. Amen. Verse 3, the sons of Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and set its doors and its bolts and its bars. This Hassanah, he's, he's recorded in Ezra as being one of the first families to come, come back from exile. When the family started to come back, he was one of the very first ones in Ezra chapter 2. And, uh, and he's still there. His family is still there um, doing this work. And so I thought that was just kind of neat, just that we have families here that are founding families of this church and they're still here, and God has used them. They served in many different ways, and, uh, and that's just one of those, those blessings that God has given us as a church. And then some of us are new, like me, and uh, we get to come into that and be part of what God is doing. Verse 4 says, And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakoz, repaired. And next to them, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, son of Meshuzbazabel, repaired. <laughs> It gets worse. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Banna, repaired. But Merimoth, Merimoth, this one it was kind of an interesting one. He too is mentioned back in Ezra chapter 2 as being one of those ones. But then later in Ezra, he's actually specifically mentioned as being one of the, Ezra had him working to, to protect or watch over the temple treasures. That was, he was given that job in Ezra now. And so this is a number of decades later. So I just say all that to say, I think he was an old man, Okay. You know, I think he was an old man. <laughs> That's how it seemed to make sense. And so it just it was kind of a reminder, here's this older man, and he's out there putting bricks in and blocks. He didn't go, no, I did my time. I served Ezra. I watched the temple treasures. Someone else lay the, be the, build up the witness of God here and build up the walls. But no, he was out there doing his part um, and still serving the Lord. Verse 5, it says, And next to them the... Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve the Lord. Tekoa was a, a town about 11 miles from Jerusalem. And so here we have this group of people that were coming from this town outside Jerusalem, and they were coming to help build the wall. Which is kind of interesting, because they're not going to get the direct benefits of being protected by the wall. They didn't, they're not going to live inside Jerusalem. And yet, they were Jews, and so they cared for, like Nehemiah, they believed in being this witness, this what they were doing to rebuild Jerusalem so they would draw people to be a witness for God and draw people. And so they believed in that. And it just made me think of like VBC and, and Bly CRC. They're coming. Why are they coming to join us? Why are we doing this together? Because jointly we believe that we care about Jesus, these kids coming to know Jesus. And so we work together. And there's people that come from the outside sometimes, and sometimes we help others. So we do do things. It's not just us and our, this little bubble, we don't do anything else. Sometimes God calls us to help something else because we're all part of his bride, like we talked about during communion. So that was kind of kind of a neat little thing there. But then we, not all of them did, unfortunately, because then it says their nobles would not stoop to serve the Lord. That word nobles is uh, connected to where we get the word aristocrat. So just think like kind of the high society, okay? And they wouldn't stoop to serve the Lord. Or I don't know if you have a different translation. Some of the different translations say they wouldn't, they wouldn't bend their necks or shoulder the load. Yeah, it's where we get the word backslide from because it, a backslide came from like an ox, the picture of like an ox or a beast of burden carrying the load. And if they're trying to slide the load off their back, where the word backslide kind of word comes from. And so that's kind of the picture. It's that word. It's that picture of they were trying to get out of it from somehow. somehow. Get out from underneath of what God was, was um, tugging on their heartstrings to do, right? And I don't know about you. I can relate to that one, right? Sometimes, you know, there's something that comes in. You kind of that little bit of a wrestle. Lord, is this what you're asking me to do? But I, we don't know what their reasons were, how they justified it. 
maybe they just didn't want as too much work, maybe they felt they were too busy, maybe they didn't want someone to see them, and what would they think if I, they saw me stacking bricks? That's what my servants do. I don't know. I don't, we don't know what their, what their reasons were, but although I'm sure they felt that tug on their hearts, they justified it, and they weren't willing to stoop to serve their Lord, their Lord. Verses 6 and 7. Jehoiada, the son of Pasea, and Meshulam, the son of Basodia, repaired the gate of Yashana. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars, and next to them repaired Melatiah, the Gibeonite, keep that in mind, Gibeonite, and Jaden, the Maranothite, the men of Gibeon and of Mizpah, the seat of the governor of the province beyond the river. In the river. So if you don't know the Gibeonites, does anybody know who, who the Gibeonites are? Yeah, I got some nods. So the Gibeonites were the ones that when, when they were, Israelites were coming to take over the promised land, that they had been given this, this command by God to, to like clear out all the, these other Canaanite nations, right? And the Gibeonites were one of them. But the Gibeonites had heard about the Israelites coming, and so they deceived and they, Israel, and they went to Joshua, and they dressed in really old clothes, and they took wormy bread, and they showed up to Joshua and said, oh, we've heard about you, and you're, you're so great. They flattered them. And then they said, would you do a peace treaty with us? And, and uh, we're from far away. Look at how tattered our clothes are and how wormy our bread is. And so Joshua didn't go to the Lord and pray and seek. Instead, he just signed it. And, uh, and so he signed this peace treaty, and then God revealed to them, actually, they, uh, they're one of the ones that I had said. So the Gibeonites become um, like workers within. They had to serve Israel. Um, and so they, uh, and they were there right through to this day. And so, but through that, through just being part of that is Israel community, a lot of them did become God-fearers. And so I just thought this was interesting that here you have these Gibeonites that weren't, you know, by blood Jewish, but they feared God. And they too cared about his witness and seeing the walls of Jerusalem built up again. And the parallel I thought of for us was just um, we're kind of a mix of different denominations, aren't we? We've got some different backgrounds, us. We're not all just one flavor here. And yet God has put us together for his good and for his plan. And so we, we want to have that common goal to build up and be a witness for Jesus and build God's witness and draw people to him. Verse 8, and next to them, Uziel, the son of Horiah, goldsmiths repaired. Next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, repaired. And they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. I thought, this is kind of interesting. You just, why do you think Nehemiah put, put in there their professions? He, he doesn't do it with many. I mean, he mentioned the priests. Outside of that, I don't think he really mentions any other professions in here. Actually, he'll mention merchants at the end. But, um, but, uh, why goldsmiths and perfumers? Like, did Nehemiah want us to know that's the best smelling section of the wall or something? Or like, right? No, it's because, I think it's because of the opposite. I think he wants to point out the fact that these, he, they, Nehemiah didn't go around and say, okay, anybody got any contracting experiment, experience? We're going to need you, okay? Everybody else carry on with the perfume making. You, you probably, skills aren't needed here. You know, no, everybody, everybody was welcomed and not just welcome, but called to come and do whatever they could to build up the witness of God. And the fact that they're perfumers, they were still able to join together in one body. And the passage that, that Tim's going to read at the end is kind of the New Testament version of that, is just that reminder of what it looks like for us to be a body in every part being important. The, the example, I'm going to brag on our youth again, um, is... Uh, from, from our church here recently is we've got the kids' church downstairs and we got a couple classes with some pretty high-energy boys. I know that because some of them are mine. And, um, <laughs> and some pretty high-energy boys. And, uh, and we've got some gifted teachers, okay? Amazingly gifted teachers that teach, but they need help in their class, okay? And so we're not asking for these boys to go and teach the lesson, but they went to some of those, uh, those youth boys and they said, hey, would you guys be the helpers because you know how to handle high energy little boys because you were one six years ago and uh and so they did and so here they just stepped into it and and just i think that's just an awesome picture of exactly that how can i help they're like they're the perfumers building the wall of doing that work at kids church and i love it 
verse 9. Next to them, Raphiah, the son of Hur, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired. So here's another ruler. And he's not too good or not too high to be able to do whatever God asks. Next to them, Jediah, the son of Haramath, repaired opposite his house. And next to him, Hattush, the son of Hashbaniah, repaired. That, uh, that Haramath, Harumath, that it's, his name literally means flat nose. You can, uh, you can pull application out of that somehow. Um, I'll leave that to you. I don't know if maybe, yeah. So, uh, verse 11. Melchijah, the son of Haram and Hashab, the son of Pahath Moab, repaired another section in the Tower of the Ovens. Now, I am not making this up in my study. I found the Tower of the Ovens was on Baker Street. I'm just, I'm just telling you. Again, you can... I was trying to think, is there some, some application? Maybe potlucks are good. That's all I could come up with out of that one. But uh, Verse 12, next to him, Shalom, the son of Halohesh, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired he and his daughters. Yeah, isn't that cool? And so I thought that was kind of a neat one. Again, I think Nehemiah put that in there on purpose. He wanted us to notice. He wanted the record to show that those daughters worked hard. That they, uh, that they joined in and they, they didn't get put to the side and that they were, did worthy, good work, right? And just what, a, what a, an example for us to be careful not to assume that someone isn't capable of helping, you know? That, uh, that there's so many things people can do. I was listening to a pastor that I podcast and he had been over to like Asia and some of these closed countries and he was talking about there is the, the evangelism that goes out and one of the, the greatest or, I don't know, moves or a ton of, one of the groups that was doing amazing evangelistic work and seeing healings and tons of people come to Christ were these children. And these children were going village to village and preaching the gospel and praying over the sick and, and kids, you know? It was just a really cool testimony that uh, they didn't just get put, okay, you guys wait until you're adults to do that. But, uh, but they, they, have, they were true believers doing amazing things. Verse 13. Then Hanun and the inhabitants of Zenoa repaired the valley gate. They rebuilt it and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars and repaired a thousand cubits of the wall as far as the dung gate. Melakijah, the son of Rechab, ruler of the district of Beth Hakram, repaired the dung gate. He rebuilt it and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. So we've got another ruler and it's doing some more work, more people coming from the outside to help. But I just wanted to highlight, I highlighted those two gates, so the valley gate and the dung gate. So both of those gates led to the Valley of Hinnom, if you've ever heard of that. The Valley of Hinnom, or you might know it by its New Testament name, Gehenna, if you've heard of that before. And so the Valley of Hinnom was this, this place, it appears pretty early in the scriptures, and it's the place when they were going into the land of Canaan, it was the place where the Canaanites would offer their babies in sacrifices to their gods. It was one of the things that God called just absolutely detestable. It comes up a number of times as like the thing that is like to show how detestable the Canaanite people had gotten. Um, I won't describe how they did it, but just horrible. And so that valley became known for that, okay? It was kind of like this cursed place. And so by the time of Jesus, it had become the dump um, for Jerusalem. And so the dung gate, it's probably better translated the refuse gate, because that was the gate they took all the garbage and everything out, and they took it out into the Valley of Hinnom, and it was lit there on fire, and so the vi- fires never stopped, and the, and the Greek name for it was Gehenna, which is, in most of your English translations, is translated hell. So when Jesus talked about hell, he was giving this picture that everybody knew of, that's where all their garbage went, they could see it, smell it, and so that was like the real tangible, like when he talked about hell, he pointed to this never-ending burning dump outside Jerusalem, this cursed place. And so that's where those two gates led to. And it's just this picture of sin. It's this picture of detestable things, everything that's separated. You know, you have Jerusalem, the dwelling place. Zion just you know, means dwelling place, dwelling place of God, right? So you have Jerusalem and the people of God and that, that picture of God's witness to the world and outside the walls is this place that represents this detestable and everything that is 
refuse and rejected and, and kept outside, um, rejected by God. And so we have those, that picture. But then look at this, the next gate. Verse 15, And Shalom, the son of Kol Hosei, ruler of the district of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. He rebuilt it and covered it and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars, and he built the wall of the pool of Shalah of the king's garden and as far as the stairs that go down from the city of David. So this fountain gate, it was named after that because there was this pool there, and it, it contained the fresh water from the spring of Gihon. And so the, the water would come in and, and pool there, and so they had this fresh water there. It was the, the, the water for the city, okay? And so you have this crazy contrast of these, the dung gate and the valley gate going out into this horrible place outside the city, but within the city you have the living water, this fresh water that gives life to the people who are inside Jerusalem, the dwelling place of God. Beautiful picture of, of what it looks like to be part of God's family, part of the new covenant, amen? And again, we want people to come from the outside to the inside, right? We're not looking to build up the wall so we can keep to ourselves. The goal is that we can invite people in and say, don't stay out there in the valley. Don't stay out there. Come on in. Would you come in and come to know the God that loves you? After him, Nehemiah, ne Nehemiah, not the same Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, ruler of the half the district of Bethzur, repaired to a point opposite the tombs of David, and as far as the artificial pool, as far as the house of the mighty men. Another, another ruler, this Beth Zur was like 33 kilometers away, and so here's somebody traveling, him and his clan, 33 kilometers to get, come to help, um, you know, like three times the distance of that Tokoa, and here's the ruler himself is participating in contrast to those ones, the nobles that wouldn't, that wouldn't bend their neck to serve their God. Verse 17 and 18, after him the Levites repaired. Um, am I going to read all those names? Rehum, the son of Bani. Next to him, Hash, Hashabiah, ruler of half the district of Keliah, Kila, Kila, repaired for his district. After him, their brothers repaired. Bavai, the son of Henadad, ruler of half the district of Kila. The Levites repaired. The Levites were the workers in the temple. So here, once again, we have this. The priests were working, but so were the Levites. We're kind of going this, this. if you ever look up and Google it or something, the picture they started, they went counterclockwise from the Temple Mount all the way around. We're coming back around to the Temple Mount now. So this is where the Levites and the priests and that would live. And so they're, they're working right there um, near their homes. And once again, we have these people who are employed, if you will, um, to serve God in the temple, and yet they're out there lifting bricks and just a reminder to me that there's nothing too low for pastors to serve in right that uh, we're not higher than but to have that humble attitude of god where would you like me to serve your church today verses 19 and 20 next to him Ezer, the son of jeshua ruler of mizpah repaired another section opposite the ascent to the armory at the buttress after him baruch the son of zadai repaired another section from the buttress to the door of the house of Eliashib, the high priest. Um, that Baruch, that repaired there, some of the translations have zealously repaired. Zealously repaired. I just thought that was kind of neat if you got your, to have your name in there, but working zealously. But, uh, but I don't know about you, I tell my kids all that all the time, like that you not just obey, but obey with a, a happy heart, <laughs> right? Willingly, the happy way, the whole way, the happy way, right away. Right away, the happy way, the whole way. And sometimes I need to hear that when God's telling me to do something, you know? Am I doing it the right way, the whole way, and the happy way? So when we do it the happy way, I think we experience the most blessing in serving God. Verse 21, after him, Merimoth. That sounds familiar. The son of Uriah, son of Hakos, repaired another section from the door of the house of Eliashib to the end of the house of Eliashib. And after him, the priests, the men of the surrounding area, repaired just highlight him because we saw him already in verse 4. So here, and it says he repaired another section. So here's somebody, I don't know, doing two ministries. I guess that's okay, all right? So you can, wherever God called, I just picture his heart. He must have been, Lord, I'll serve however, and, and God called him to serve in two places. 
And after them, Benjamin and Hashub repaired opposite their house. And after them, Azariah, the son of Maasiah, son of Ananiah, repaired beside his own house. And there's going to be that phrase a couple more times. But I just, I highlighted that. It reminded me of Tim's sermon. You know, and just where is God that it starts at home? God's calling for us to build up our witness for Jesus, to draw people to God. It starts in our own homes with our own kids and our own families. And then it starts with your neighbors, the people right out front of your house, right? Who are those ones that God is calling you to build or to reach, to be a witness to? And then 24 and 25, after him, Benui, the son of Henadad, repaired another section from the house of Azariah to the buttress and to the corner. Palau, the son of Uzai, repaired opposite the buttress and the tower projecting from the upper house of the king at the court of the guard. After him, Pediah, the son of Parash. And the temple servants living on Ophel repaired the point opposite the water gate on the east in the projecting tower. After him, the Tekoites, there they are again, repaired another section opposite the great projecting tower as far as the wall of Ophel. Above the horse gate, the priest repaired, each one opposite his own house. Another one's doing opposite their own house. Just highlighted the water gate there. We're going to see that again in, in chapter after chapter 8 because that's where um, they're going to call the people together to assemble to read the word of God and recovenant themselves to God. And so the water gate wasn't in the wall of Jerusalem. You see, they didn't rebuild it. They repaired the wall opposite the water gate. So the water gate was already done and finished. Um, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a gate to the temple um, complex, the temple mount. So that's what the water gate was, and that's where they're going to gather in a few chapters from now. Um, it was a good reminder, too, just uh, the priority that obviously the water gate was already repaired, and so they had prioritized um, the temple and the, and the wall around it and the, and the gates there had already been repaired. Priority of God's temple and the foundation of God's word. Lastly, we had there the priests, again, are working right outside their homes. And then verse 29 gets interesting. And after them, Zadok, the hen of Immer, repaired opposite his own house. And after him, Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, repaired. East gate repaired. This east gate is, is pretty significant in, in the scriptures. Um, we have it earlier on in Ezra. Ezra describes that it was God's presence leaves the temple and goes out the east gate before Babylon comes and destroys it. And so it's through this gate that God's presence left before Jerusalem was destroyed. Um, church or Jewish history says that, that this was the gate that Jesus rode in on Palm Sunday. It's kind of neat. The king, the one, the Messiah, and the line of David would come through this same east gate. And then Ezekiel 43, 1 to 7 um, it talks about, it says that it's the gate that Jesus is going to return through, that he's going to come and stand on, on the mountain and come through that gate into, the, into Jerusalem, Ezekiel 43. And so that's kind of looking to the, to the future, and that's where my mind and heart went. It was just a reminder that um, as we look to build up the church and to build our witness, it's because Jesus is coming back. Because Jesus is coming back, that there's an eternity at stake. It's for that reason that we need to be about building his church and building our witness. Because there's an eternity at stake. And he is coming back. I'll just read it here. This is such a reminder of the future hope that we look to. The work that we do as a church is so much more than how it just helps people in this life. Some of what we do does help people practically now. But our work is more significant because it has an impact on eternity. We want people to come to know Jesus because he is going to come someday and the new Jerusalem will come down from heaven. And we want as many people as possible to live in the safety and protection of that relationship with God for all eternity. And then it finishes off with these two verses, and I'll just read them through. You'll see we'll end again at the, at the Sheep Gate. After him, Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hanun, the sixth son of Zalaf, repaired another section. And after him, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, repaired opposite his chamber. 
After him, Melchijah, one of the goldsmiths, another goldsmith in there, repaired as far as the house of the temple servants and of the merchants opposite the muster gate and to the upper chamber of the corner and between the upper chamber of the corner and the sheep gate. Gone all the way around, the goldsmiths and the merchants repaired. Um, and so they've repaired it all the way around. Well, they've started repairing. This is what they're working on. We're going to see in the next chapter. Um, that uh, coming to completion. Just three things, and then Tim's going to come up after I just go through these three things and kind of give us a New Testament um, just reading, just going to read it and leave us with something for us to take. And again, just listening for what God's saying for us. But three general things after going through all that that uh, kind of we can kind of take from it. One, there was a plan. Interesting. You see, Nehemiah obviously had a plan, very structured. These people working on this section from this point to this point. Um, and so that's just a reminder that it's not wrong to plan, that you know, Corinthians talks about orderly worship, that we, we do plan, we seek the Lord. And so we're planning for VBC. There's a ton of planning that goes into VBC and all these different ministries and all the work that we do. And so thank you for all of you, but planning, there was a plan. Number two, as we saw, everyone helped. Didn't matter your profession, didn't matter if you had a high position or low position, men, women, old, young, beautiful picture of of the church and again we're going to hear that in just a moment from tim and then the last one i I didn't commentaries pointed out i didn't pick up on this but this was really really interesting that you'll notice all the way through it was the word repair 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 that they didn't change the design they were repairing gate the gates already had the names they were building up the gates that were there repairing them repairing the wall they didn't make the wall bigger smaller move gates around change the design at all they just repaired what was and, and the commentary kind of pulled this from it. It just said, that's just a reminder that we're not, we don't have to try and, in order to be a witness for God, we don't have to figure out the new, new thing, the secret combination, secret lock to all of a sudden unlock a revival, right? It's the same that it's always been. Preach the gospel of Jesus. People need to hear the name of Jesus. We have God's word built on God's word as we go out and make disciples, teaching them right, everything Jesus commanded. That We're just simply sharing the love of the God who made them and inviting them to follow him. And so it was that reminder that we're repairing. The name of God is the witness. Jesus is who he is. He hasn't changed. Um, sometimes we don't do a great job of being a witness, but that's what we're looking to build up. Tim, would you come close us and read this is tim's going to read from romans chapter 12 and um this is uh this is kind of a new testament um parallel if you will and so again i just encourage you just to listen and uh and hear is there anything that god is is asking you to to apply from this thanks tim